that damn sister, Miss yeah. Seely's Blues, right. I was nervous. I Because when I first got the script, they were like, that's the one song I was nervous about. And I was like, I don't have to sing Sister, right? <laughs> and they were like, oh, yeah, no, you just have to hum it. And I was like, yes. And then, I don't know, all of a sudden, Quincy Jones was like, no, I want my song in the movie. Come on, y'all. <laughs> and I was like, ah! Jeffrey Wright. Hello, Taraji. I just want to start by giving you your flowers. Um, no. <laughs> Those don't compare. I've been a student of your work for a very long time. You are absolutely one of the top in the game. One of my favorite. Usually when people go, you want a career like, or I want to do work like, it's usually like the same sex, but it was always you and Don Cheadle. Mm. I remember watching Basquiat, and I was like, that's the work I want to do. Oh, wow. And then after that, I watched everything you did like this. Oh. Don't look too close. No, to I promise you. Some of it, you know. Is... You're humble. That's great. I get it. <laughs> but I just wanted to give you your flowers. Because well, I you. know how it can be in the industry sometimes. Mm, and well, I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you knock you. it out the ballpark every time. Well, thank you. Thank you. you <laughs> know, and that's in my time. Under... A couple final tips here and there, well, but, you know, well, I made you contact. Know, yeah. It comes with the territory. It does. You it know? does. I watched The Color Purple <laughs> last night, and I had forgotten, oh, of course, it's based on the musical. So this is why we returned to it. And it was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And your work, because this is iconic. It's iconic mm -hmm. book, iconic film, iconic performances. And that's very challenging to kind of come back and reinvent. And you did it. It was so beautiful and so dynamic and so, I mean, she sang it. <laughs> I mean, it was stunning. I mean, everyone across the board, it looks beautiful. I want to ask you about something before we get too deep into it. You, you, you know what I want to talk about, right, though? I'm scared. What? Come on. DC. Oh, that's right. You are my come, homie. Come on. That's right. Come on. So I want to ask as well about how you think DC has informed you, mm. you know, your mm -hmm. artistry, your interest. Mm -hmm. But a couple things. You went to North Carolina A&T. Yes. Right? My father went to North Carolina A&T. You went to Howard. Mm -hmm. My mother went to Howard Law School. You played uh, Katherine Johnson. Yes. My mother's first cousin worked with Katherine Johnson. She was one of the, you know, these human calculators. Computers, human yeah, computers. computers mm -hmm. Right down, because my family is from, I mean, I can throw a rock from my grandmother's house to Langley Air Force Base. Wow. It's right down. So I'm kind of wondering if we might not be family anyway, but you also, are from, where were you born? Washington, D.C. Where in D.C.? Um, I was born Gold Place. You okay. know where but North... You, but you, where, you in, were you in Southeast? Northeast. When you, you were Northeast, Northeast. okay. Because I grew up in Southeast. Yeah, and that's where I actually spent most of my life. Right. I was born, uh, I say we moved from Northeast when I was in the first grade. Okay. That's when we moved to Southeast off of Livingston Road. My first home was in Northeast on Fort Totten yeah. Drive. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I keep forgetting you from the area. Oh, yeah. But you are. That's right. Yeah. Um, and but then you were in P Prince George's County a bit? I So ninth grade, I auditioned for Duke Ellington School of the Fine Arts. Ah, uh, okay. Tenth grade. Okay. And didn't get accepted. Uh -huh. So I had to go where we lived, and that was Oxon Hill. It wasn't by choice. It's just that I, I had see. to. So we, we might have crossed paths <laughs> yeah. in, in Iverson Mall or something. Somewhere, <laughs> Landover, somewhere. <laughs> At a go-go, who knows? Right. But so, so uh, do you think, you know, there have been so many incredible artists, performers, musicians that mm, have come out of D.C., mm -hmm. Do you think that DC, because you play a range of things, you know, and then that's color purple, there's like this Southern thing, you know, which in, people don't realize DC is actually a Southern town in many ways. Very much so. Do you think that growing up there, can you describe how do you think it's informed the work that you do in, in, in certain ways? DC is a real unique place because mm. of go-go music. Mm -hmm. And we were already stars. Like, mm. you know what I mean? Mm. DC has this air about it like, like if you or I were walking down the street, they'd be like, oh, that go Jeffrey Wright or Taraj, mm. but mm. you know what I mean? Mm. It's just this mm. air because 
there's this whole um, genre of music that right. only exists in D.C. Afro-Potomac. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And it gives you, you're, you're proud and a certain confidence. Right. And D.C. is a tough audience. It's yeah. a tough crowd. Right. You know? And so if you can win over that audience, it's almost like if you can make it in D.C., you can make it anywhere. I know people say that about New York. Right. But D.C. is a tough crowd. Yes. Like, you can come and they can love you. You hit one wrong note on that stage, you might get Coca-Cola cans thrown outside. <laughs> right. You know? <laughs> so, um, I would definitely say that D.C. developed a very tough skin for me, mm. um, especially training at Howard University. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Vera uh, Katz, Vera Katz mm -hmm. Mike Malone, I studied with her a little bit. Henry Edmonds, you know, they didn't care who, mm. how cute you were, how long your hair was, how thin you were. You could be replaced at any given moment. Mm. And that university is where I learned the word no. Mm. And I was like, I want you to tell me no, because I'm going to prove something to you. So I learned that just from D.C. in mm, general. Sure, sure. Yeah. You studied musical theater at Howard? I started off as just regular drama. Then I went to an audition for, no, I went to a rehearsal for Dream Girls. And I, when they started singing, I was like, oh my God, I, I want to do this. Mm. So I switched my major and was very successful in the musical theater department. But then I got pregnant my junior year. Mm. And now I'm a mother, time is ticking, and mm. now I can't stay in college forever. So I, music theory is like math. Mm. I suck at math. So I switched my you were great at math back in to the movie. drama. Well, you know, I'm a great actress. <laughs> <laughs> Good at acting. <laughs> yeah, that was funny because I failed pre calc. <laughs> make it to you make it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what I find most interesting about your career, and this is this true? Basquiat was your, was that your first leading role? Mm -hmm. Well, the first leading role I mm -hmm. witnessed. Yes, it was, yeah. And so in your new film, this is your first leading role since then? No. No, it's not, because you did get Boycott. Boycott. OG. Duh. Cadillac Records. Well, somebody on um, internet got it wrong. Because I was like, that can't you be true. You mean on the internet, it was not true? It was not true. Something posted? On wrong. Wow, imagine that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> And I love that you get to show your comedic chops in this. Oh yeah. Mr. Lee, is this um is this based on your actual life? Yeah, you think some bitch ass college boy can come up with that shit? No, 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 I don't. You know, when I first started acting, actually, when I was in uh when I was in college, like my junior, I was a political science major and, and mm. You know, grew up in D.C. You mm -hmm. know, everybody talks politics in mm -hmm. D.C. Everybody from the dude who's like, the, you know, watching the corner, yep. every, you know, on everybody. So it's in the blood. So I was a political science major, but I started acting like my junior year, and I switched. But the, this first teacher that we had, he was this old, like, mm, he was kind of patrician, <laughs> old New England. I mm. think he had understudied Burl Ives in a Cat on a Hot Tin wow. Roof. And anyway, he had gone to Yale drama school, and I asked him if he would write me a little letter of recommendation because I didn't have anybody else who had taught me really. I'd done a couple of plays, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, he, and I said, "Yeah, you know, I think I want to apply to Yale and I'm do a, you know, I think I want to be an actor." He's like, "Oh, oh, oh well, I, you know, you might be an Eddie Murphy type, but I don't think you would be a serious." <laughs> I was like, he said that really. It was just ridiculous. I mean, I love Eddie. Eddie. I mean, Eddie's mm -hmm. one of the baddest ever. But it was. Also because I used to like just cut up with everything that I did. We could be doing checkoff and I would try to find like mm -hmm. the humor. <laughs> well, and there often was. So I've always done comedy, and particularly on stage, you mm -hmm. know. But I've never really, for whatever reasons, in film had a lot. There've been some stuff, you know, like Broken Flowers, the Wes mm -hmm. Anderson stuff. You mm -hmm. know, I love mm -hmm. the humor, his humor, and, and, and but yeah, this was nice. Yeah, because it's 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 it was sharp. It was sharply tuned and smart and topical. So that was cool. But it's not a comedy. It's funny, but it's not a comedy. Absolutely. Because, because mm -hmm. for me, really, the heart of the story and the thing that I connected to on a personal level, I think the the social commentary mm -hmm. and the satire is really kind of rapping for the gift that is this story of a family and this man who all of a sudden is left with his thumbs in the dike of this family that is coming apart. Mm -hmm. And that for me was, was what drew me and what I understood 
emotionally and personally, mm -hmm. you know, because we reach that age where, you know, all of a sudden everybody's looking at you to be the adult in the room. Oh, I'm the adult now? <laughs> You're right. My mom actually passed away. Oh, uh, I'm so thank sorry. Thank you. Not too long before I got this, mm. this script, and I think Cord has, you know, similar, the or director Cord Jefferson had similar resonances with this story of this guy trying to be the caretaker of the one who was his caretaker and yeah. and with the pressures that come with that and the sacrifices that are made as a result and things like that. Exactly. Invariably, you, you, you go too far. You think? <laughs> I don't think yes. I go far enough. It's becoming hurtful. Oh. See? You know, See? invariably, oh. you, you, you go too far. I love the comedy elements of it, the irony and all that stuff. We had a ball with it, but the real heart of it for me was was the story of this crazy, loving, weird, as they all are, family that happens to be black folks. Mm -hmm. And for me as well, it's 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 really the most subversive element of the story of mm -hmm. the film. Mm -hmm. Because while the film discusses, you know, these tropes and these stereotypes that, you know, are too often kind of pushed out and commodified and you know, monetized in our culture, the antithesis of that is a story about people being people, yeah. which we don't. And I'd never, I'm like, wow, I'm going to play on, you know, because Tracy, Tracy Ellis Ross mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Sterling, Sterling K. Brown, who play my siblings, but they, they've done stuff, you know, like uh, uh, This Is Us and, yeah. you know, Family Orange mm -hmm. and some Tracy with Blackish. and But I, had, I was like, wow, I've never, I've never been asked, you know, to do this much comedy, but also I've never been asked to play, you know, these family dynamics. And wow. it was, yeah, it was super cool. That's interesting you say that about the comedy and how that was your thing all the, in the beginning of your career. You know, well, before you became Jeffrey Wright, the serious dramatic actor. Um, yeah. But that's true for me too. Mm. Like when I moved to LA, I moved to be, I, want, I thought I was gonna book a sitcom mm. cause I was a single mother. And you know, that schedule really, I needed that schedule. Right. They're bankers hours. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? I was like, good, I could drop the kid off, I can go to work and I'll be there to pick him up. And I was like, this is perfect for me. And I, when I first started booking, that's what I was booking, mm. sitcoms, mm. like guest stars, special appearance, sister, sister, smart guy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm off to the races. Mm. I'm gonna get that sitcom. And then I booked Baby Boy. And then after that, every I was just this dramatic actress. And I was like, but I'm funny. Like mm. I literally, that's what I came to LA to do. I wanted to book a sitcom. Mm. I wanted to be the funny girl. But you have that, <laughs> I mean, you have that energy you know, yeah. ab about you. Cause I think sometimes the funniest stuff is in the most dramatic oh, films. Oh, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. You have that energy. But that's interesting that you say, you talk about, it's so, and it goes back to actually the story about the ways in which family mm -hmm. shapes our creative life and choices. So when you talk about that, the range of stuff that you do, you choose things too because it serves <laughs> your needs as a mother. To have, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? Yes. But yeah. to me, I think the best dramatic actors are the comedians. Mm because they tap another level that maybe the most serious dramatic actors kind of miss. Mm. And that's the humor. Sure. We, we're, we'll laugh at the same thing that makes us cry. Right. You know, in that same breath, we might be laughing and then five seconds later we're crying. So I've always, like Richard Pryor's like, sure. Man, like oh. oh, come on. You know, I thought Eddie about Murphy, him when I was working he, on this film. And Eddie Murphy, when he started doing serious things, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. It's just something about comedians mm. that bring another element that may be overlooked by the serious. Well, it's interesting, yeah, because in 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 this film, your father mm -hmm. is played by David uh, uh, Alan Greer, mm -hmm. but he's on that line. It's so interesting because you know that like that final scene with the two of you that kind of redemption, you know, coming mm. home scene is so beautiful, it's so simple, you know, as as opposed to the original, which yes. is this grand thing, but still musical, because I mean, really, her, you know, Suge is a musical character mm -hmm. in both, but the way it was pared down and simplified, it was so beautiful, so wonderful, and so touching. It's like, no, this is just about us two. And David has this thing where in his face, it's like, is he going to go to the other side? But he's riding right on that line. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's in the two of you, it's really, it's, it's lovely. This ain't me. Hush. Put it on. 
you gonna be my guest tonight. Tell me about where did you guys film this? When did you film it? We started filming at the end of February last year. Uh -huh. And we filmed it in Atlanta. Uh, you know, all over right. Atlanta, Savannah. Do you have roots in the South at all? I do. My mom's family is from Scotland Neck, North Carolina. Okay, Scotland Neck. Scotland Neck. <laughs> <laughs> that town, I don't even know if it's made it on the map yet. That's uh -huh. how small it is. You don't go downtown, you go to town. Uh -huh. You know, town is like Mayberry. Like, they right. still park in the middle of the street, and that's the one way, and that's the other way. Right. They have a Tasty Freeze, right, a Piggly Wiggly. You got to. General Dollar. You in the South. <laughs> You know, the hood is on the side, of the opposite side of the um, train tracks. Like, you can clearly see it. Right. Yeah, so that's where, when you talk about the Southern women, actually, mm -hmm. my mother, I was like the only cousin. We have a big family. I was the only cousin that would get shipped down to the, down south. Okay. For the summer. Every summer. Every summer. Me too. Literally, my mother would pick me up from school with uh -huh. my bags packed uh -huh. in the trunk. That's right. And I used to hate it. Cause oh. I was, I was a, you know, I was from the city and I went from yonk, yonk, honk, honk to cricket, cricket. Yeah. <laughs> you can't see your hand in front of your face at night. But as I grew older, I, I don't even know if my mother was clear on what she was doing. Mm. She was saving me from the environment that we lived in, mm -hmm. you know. And having you touch the rock. Yeah. And whenever I play these Southern women. Right. That's what I draw yes, from, that's you know, because yeah. it was just me and grandma. We watched soaps. We hung out with her friends. It was, and not only that, being a creative child and an only child, I was, I was, I was had a well. very vivid imagination. Mm -hmm. So slowing down life and making it quiet and all this land and as far as the eye can see, I had so much space to create yeah. and play. And so I cherish it now, but yeah. I didn't like it so much when I was a kid. Interesting. I wanted to ask you about it. I have a similar experience. My, my mother's family, well, my, my father's family was, was from Greensboro, mm. Um, mm -hmm. North Carolina. But, mm -hmm. you know, he passed when I was very young. My mother's family was from uh, around Hampton area. In yes. The lower, mm -hmm. lower Chesapeake. So my, you know, I would, same thing. First week after school, get in the car, head down. Oh. And the, for a week before school, she'd come back and pick me up. <laughs> I loved it. I loved mm. it because we were right on the water. Go, you know, my grandfather was a waterman. He was crab or oysterman, farmer, sold Love some crab. whiskey. Mm -hmm. You know, he had the whole thing. So the house was wild. The mm -hmm. house was, you know, people come get seafood, vegetables, and a taste, you know. So there were people, you know, and I was just hearing this language. And I wonder what I wanted to ask you about was uh, exactly that. You, you know, this film, the language of that novel and the language of the film and the language of these people can be played in certain ways where the music is not understood. And mm -hmm. I've heard, you know, it's not everybody hears it, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but I was, that's why I was wondering if you did have, you know, you have to have had oh, yeah. that music play for you, like that, that linguistic music play for, for you, and you mm -hmm. have to have gone down there. And particularly as a child, as you say, alone. And also I think, for me anyway, going from the city to the rural mm -hmm. environment, made my ear more tuned Absolutely. to differences, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, I dug it. Yeah. And then also you had to figure out how to, okay, how do I navigate this space now? Mm -hmm. And I go to this other space, it's a different vibe, different language, and, how do I, and, it, and I, I, I think it really was part, because I always as well loved the spoken word, you yeah. know, and dial, and because I was hearing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But I was gonna ask you exactly about that in terms of this, you know, what do you, what is that language, like the language of, this character and that and that and the novel and this film what does it mean to you i mean it just takes me back well like i said it's nostalgic because mm -hmm. i was spent a lot of time around these women and not only that it makes me feel safe because growing up in dc i watched my mom get robbed twice mm. once at gunpoint i was six and the second time she punched in the eye so hard wow. at her breath in the tour mm. And so I just always remember when I would go south and I would hear those sounds. You know, the south has a certain smell. Mm. Sometimes you might get a whiff of hog, <laughs> but you know, mm. it's that smell. So whenever I hear a southern accent or I go to the south, I just always have this overwhelming sense of safety, mm. of being safe. Of home. Home. Mm -hmm. and, and the women of this time and era, like, you talk about sexy. Yeah. Those women were sexy. Mm. They left so much to the imagination. Yeah. 
And so that's what that all means to me. It means class, elegance, black excellence for sure, because you know, when you go to the South, you don't have as much means as you do in the city. So mm-hmm. you're seeing a lot of people make things with their own hands that they just don't have access to. They, because they, they can be creative. They mm-hmm. have time, they have space. DC, you know, in the, in the city, everything's rush, rush, fast, right. fast, fast. And you're comparing to the space where you're trying to keep up with this person and that person. And just in the South, something is just very safe about sitting on the porch and fanning flies and waving at everybody coming by. It's a connection. That's right. Well, in the city, we're like tunnel vision, right? you know? So whenever I get a chance to play a Southern character or a timepiece, I really love those yeah. because it takes me back to a time of, is where I felt certainly much safer. Right. <laughs> and, well, but that's what the, you, the, the film is very much about too, a sisterhood, a family of women oh, yeah. who honor and protect one another to the extent that they can, one another's safety, mm-hmm. you know? And it's a celebration of that in such a beautiful way. And it's also a celebration of of the South yeah. and of where we many of us emerged out of. Absolutely. You know? And the women often who led the charge. Mm-hmm. You know. This is a question I want to ask you. How do you pick your roles? <laughs> it was different early on than it was. <laughs> exactly. Except, you know, because you got you know, as you say, you got kids. Well, it's like you know, I don't want to go. I'm not going away for six months. My son is, you know, yeah. three years old. I'm not mm-hmm. doing that. So I mean, you know, I'm, you know, and maybe I won't do a the bigger. I'll do, yeah, it's a little, a two week thing, two yeah. week hit, three weeks. Mm-hmm. I can pay tuition and all that. Okay, boom, I'll hit it and come yeah. back, you know. But I mean, I choose. So there are different reasons. I mean, all these things that we, when we were younger, we take for granted. But um, the kids are older now. They're both in college now. Yeah. So I can like, whew, I can like, <laughs> wow. Wow, look at me. There's a me here. <laughs> exactly. I can, but I, I think the thing for me really has always been though the words on the page, the script, but also more so now is the people that I work with. Mm, is the yeah. collaboration. Yep. That's, How come we've never worked together? I don't what is know. going on? I don't know. God. Well, you're definitely on the list. Well, 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 where's the where's, list? Where your people at? Where, 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 <laughs> where's the list of projects? I mean, let's, you know, yeah, we should, yeah, we should, I don't know. Come on. I don't know. It's crazy that we haven't. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. But we're doing this. Well, you know. So, you know. There's a rhyme and reason why I do things. It is. Uh, they said, Jeffrey Wright, I said, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's very cool. Certain things just kind of happen. Mm-hmm. Certain things just become kind of, it seems like, faded, you know? Yeah. There are two movies, I think, that are the most personal stories for me, or, or stories that I was most personally aligned with mm-hmm. in terms of the characters. This movie mm-hmm. and Basquiat. Oof. And I think there's similar stories that, you know, about an artistic identity and the misperception of those and the manipulation of others outside and that attempt to be one's authentic, artistic, black self. Yeah. This is who I am. Mm -hmm. If you don't get it, that's not my problem. Mm -hmm. You know, that- Unapologetically, even in your work, yeah. But but Basquiat as well, because Mm -hmm. I moved to New York about, actually about a month before he passed and I lived on the Lower East Side I, the people that I knew that were of the same circle. And I just, I came to New York for that energy, you know? I came to New York to like, you know, cause it was wild, it was free. Yeah. You know, it was, everything was possible. And I was trying to be a young creative person, you know? So I understood him and I also understood his language, his creative language and his references, his visual references and his, and his poetry. Mm. It was speaking from a similar reservoir, yeah. I think that I pull from, like he would, you know, the, it was references to the, you know, the American uh, experience as told through a black lens, whether mm-hmm. it be in the South or the Caribbean. And, mm-hmm. you know, the heroes that he would reference, like Miles Davis, Muhammad mm-hmm. Ali, Dizzy Gillespie, all of the, you know, undiscovered genius of the Mississippi Delta, all of this stuff was like, this is my shit. You yeah. Know? You know, and I, and, I, and I understood something about his journey, trying to make his way through this world that was this, you know, largely unwelcoming of him mm-hmm. and to which he was a danger because of this, the nature of his narrative, you mm-hmm. know, that he, you know, he was 
but he was disruptive, you know? Yeah. Anyway, so the reason I say that some roles just kind of, because I was doing Angels in America on Broadway mm -hmm. at the time, mm -hmm. and I'd been doing it for about a year and a half. And three of us, Joe Mantello and David Marshall Grant, decided that we were going to um, put in our notice that we were, okay, mm -hmm. year and a half, seven hour play. Okay, we're good oh. after a year and a half, you know? And so I, you know, wrote my little thing, you know, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> Your <laughs> resignation and, letter. And took, and took it, you know, took it down to the theater, boom, dropped it down. Okay, good. Huh? We, you know, and then I went home after the show. It was a matinee. I came back to my apartment, which was up on the Upper West Side, not too far from the thing. And I hit, you know, we used to have phones with answering yes. machines. And I hit my voicemail, and it was a friend of mine named Randy Sabusabo, who had been a producer for like Abel Ferrara films and worked in, you know, I knew him from from the neighborhood. And he said, "Hey, Jeffrey." I'm helping this casting director try to find someone to play Jean-Michel Basquiat. And I just wanted to let you know and thought, and I said, that's what I'm doing next. Mm -hmm. It was literally the day that I left or said that I was leaving to leave the show in a few weeks. I said, that's the next thing. I just knew, it. it well, you know, some yeah. things just like choose you, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, we had a few corners I had to, kind of navigate to get there, but that, that was, you know, so that, so I choose them, some, some, uh, I have no choice. Yeah, some, you know? some just fall right in your lap. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for me, like, The Color Purple, I remember Stephen Bray, who worked on the music, right. and, you know, and I remember when we went to Broadway, you know, he and Stephanie Elaine got married. Stephanie Elaine produced Hustle and Flow, mm. where I had to sing a little some right. hook to a rap. You know, people are like, oh, you can sing. And I'm like, that's not singing, but okay. <laughs> With Terrence, you were doing it. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And so Stephen, I guess, I guess Stephanie and Stephen pillow talk. And anyway, he reached out to me or I tapped me to play Suge on Broadway. And I was like, oh, no, mm. <laughs> not this throat. Mm. Like, I'll blow my, like, I just, you know, singing, that's, a, you, that's your instrument, right? Sure. And I don't practice every day. I hear it's you. something that I can do yeah. when I have to do it. I have but to sit down. That Broadway story is another, that that's Broadway, another story. And I'm, look, yeah. I knew better. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, nope. Right. And so, like you said, you know, if it's meant for you, you can't run from it. Because right. years later, it came, it came back, back full. And Stephen was like, Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So okay. I couldn't run from Suge if I tried. But now, have you, I mean, you've done other pieces where you sang like this, though? Never. Wow. No. In college, yes. Right. Okay. But there's nothing out in the universe that shows me singing like wow. this. Hard Out Here for a Pimp was it. Right. Anybody can right. do that. You sing it once and they loop it. <laughs> but <laughs> for, for me, like, Suge is the most challenging. But vocally. that tells you something, though, what you just said. What? Just about the nature of a lot of the music that's out there now oh, in well, terms of, like, you know. You said it, I did Hey, it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. The truth. It is what it is. It's disposable. You a know? lot of it. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's, it's cheaply it's, made. It is. Cheaply bought. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But, but, you know, like like I was saying, Suge, you know, what was very challenging for her was that she's the only one in the film that really sings pretty much all the genres. She sings gospel, jazz, and the blues. Hmm. She's the only one. Right. That's not easy. That's not something like that damn sister, Miss yeah. Seeley's Blues. Right. I was nervous. I Because when I first got the script, they were like... I, I, that's the one song I was nervous about. And I was like, I don't have to sing Sister, right? <laughs> and they were like, oh, yeah, no, you just have to hum it. And I was like, yes. And then, I don't know, all of a sudden, Quincy Jones was like, no, I want my song in the movie. Come on, y'all. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. yeah. But I guess what I did prove to myself, and people know that, that know, that went to school with me and know that I can sing, no, right? Acting is, is I'm strong in that, because that's something that I practice every day. This is my instrument. I practice with it all the time. I have a switch, I can turn it on, I can turn it off. I live in between takes. You know, mm -hmm. it's, I, I can, that's something I can do with my eyes closed, right? In my sleep. Singing is something I really have to focus on. Right. And I'm not as confident in it as I am my acting. But so you, I but second you, guess myself a lot. But you, it, it seems like you are when we watch you and hear you, so you at least act like you're confident because not only the singing, though, but just like the full body, like the everything, the yeah. movement, the, I mean, it was just like full on. But maybe in some ways, though, because it's interesting that you, you say that, you know, she, you know, she 
traverses all of these genres of, mm -hmm. of American music. And all that music comes from the South. All of it. You know, it's all a celebration of all that stuff we were talking mm -hmm. about earlier, you know, and it's there. Mm -hmm. And it's the voices in some ways, anybody can sing. No, but can you you're reach, right. Can you reach down? Have you touched that stuff, you yeah. know? Yeah. Can you make me feel it? Yeah. So I can close my yeah. eyes and hear pretty tones, yeah. you know, pretty tunes and tones, but can you make me feel what you're saying? Yeah. You know, and I think that's where the acting helps. Yeah. You know, because yeah. yeah. whenever I couldn't get a note, they were like, just imagine yourself. And as soon as I had to use my imagination, I would get it. Yeah. You know, but that's wonderful. Right. You know, because, you know, you you what, 23 years old. Right. Me now. <laughs> yeah. Actually, 25. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> You know, it's wonderful that, like, at this stage, you know, to be able to to discover, you know, like, to new challenges. Oh you know? yeah, and that's actually how I pick my roles. Like, if it doesn't scare the shit out of me, I don't want to do it. Yeah. Chances are, I don't need. It's not my job. Right. You know, because I feel like if I'm challenged, then that means some kind of way I have to change or transform. And if I'm changed and transformed, then the audience will be. Yeah. You know, but if I'm just walking through it, no, you know. Audience is very smart. They're very, they're really in tune and smart. And I think sometimes we don't give them the credit. Sure. You know, like yeah. I hate when I get on a set and they're like, well, can you just say that? And it's like, don't belittle the audience like that. Yeah. And we don't have to spoon feed them right. everything. Let them use their imagination. And I think some of the most powerful scenes in movies and cinematography are unspoken. I'm always watching the person who's not talking. That was what I was struck about with that scene with you and David, that final scene. Yeah. No words. No words. No words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that and every, was bliss. And everything said. What you needed to say. Yeah. I love scenes like that. Yeah. I'm not sure I would imagine that this author, Ellison, is black. That's me, Ellison. Yeah. He is me. And he and I are black. So what do you think American fiction is trying to say to the people? <laughs> I think, you know, there's a lot of ambiguity in it. I think there's a lot, you know, it's not trying to, you need, why if you don't, you know, it's not trying to be like kind of pedantic and, you know, like in that way. But I think it's trying to raise some interesting questions. I think the movie is, it's an exploration of the idea that, you know, hey, just like y'all, you know, we are not a monolith, mm. you know? Mm. There's a wide variety, like with all humans, to all humans, you know? One of the problems, I think, is that our country, and it's obviously it's a story that deals with identity and race and, mm -hmm. and, and culture and perceptions and things like this, um, self-perceptions even, but our country is very complex in terms of race, very oh. complicated race present and race past. Mm -hmm. It has always been so. It has always from the beginning, from the, you know, when they were John Hancocking those original documents, mm -hmm. it has always been a diverse place. Whether you wanted to uh, acknowledge that or not, mm -hmm. that was the case. And throughout, we've always had these very complicated relationships Com complicated identities that we have lived as a society. Mm -hmm. Always. It informs us all the time. The problem is, though, that the collective in this country lacks a fluency in race. Mm. We don't understand race dynamics, mm -hmm. race language, because we want to shy away from it at times. We don't, well, can't talk about that. It's too scary. Mm -hmm. So we're so ignorant of who we are, what the possibilities are, what authenticity is, what, you know, the range of identity is, and we kind of narrow it down to these dumb ideas of what's right, of, of what is and what isn't, and then we, we, we try to apply, like, I think sometimes well-intentioned uh, responses mm -hmm. to problems, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, diversity and inclusion, or the exact, you know, we try to create well-intentioned responses, but without the depth of understanding and so sometimes these things are counterproductive mm -hmm. instead of being about real you know progressive change and i think the film is is on is touching on that you know yeah. in a lot of ways you know you may be well intentioned but with this i mean you know 
but that thing that I mean, and, <laughs> and it's just also about the absolute absurdity sometimes right? of all of us in our little country too, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the things that people catch on to and obsess over yeah. as opposed to like letting some shit just slide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's not, I mean, I think we, you know, I think, you know, inside and outside of, you know, the, you know, the black community um, there, you know, you can, you can point, and say, yeah, maybe we could do that a little bit better. You mm -hmm. know, I think we internalize too. Absolutely. You know, we, in, we internalize kind of some of the negative perceptions of ourselves. I think a lot of, in some ways, I think there may be, particularly for black boys, young men, mm -hmm. take on this internal disparagement and it becomes their own. Yeah. They sort of accept their own limitations. Yeah, oh God, please. Celebrate them even, you know? <sighs> and and I, I think a l some of that has to do with a lot of the messaging in pop culture. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunate incidents that are a result of, like this kid, Elijah McClain, the other, you know, the, the cop, the case, you know, the guy, one of the cops mm -hmm. was acquitted. Yeah. He's walking down the street. Yeah. He's an odd kid. Mm -hmm. But he's, by all reports, a gentle kid. Mm -hmm. He's an oddball. Good that for him. make him a criminal. Good for him. Mm -hmm. But you see him walking down the street and you see this character mm -hmm. that, I, you know, my character has created, Stag R. Lee. Mm -hmm. Look at him, fugitive, dangerous. And he's just a kid walking just down the kid. street. And that's how stupid we are. Yeah. Too sure. often mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. And that's how dangerous we are. And that's what the film partly is getting to. Yeah. That we need to be... So y'all can get me and bring DC out. Bring we, it, come on. We need to be fucking smart. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's and we can be if we just we take the time. If, we can to stop ignoring the information and ignoring the history. Take it all in. Mm -hmm. Don't be scared. You know, like my character, I got over it. You get over it. Right, exactly. <laughs> and then we can. Then we maybe we can. You know, see some real progress. That's what I love most about being an artist and what we do. To sit and be a talking head and just telling people what they should do, this, this falls on deaf ears. Yeah. But if somebody can turn on a television or go to a theater and see themselves, that's all art is doing, is putting it to you like yeah. this. Now what you gonna do about it? And they it? can open up other possibilities. Absolutely. Because you know we just tell the stories and somebody else has to write the story in real life, you know? Exactly. But, that's, but there's, you know, I've learned to understand that there's value in that and that's why it's so commodified, you know, mm -hmm. because there is real value in that. It's just about how we get those stories that have value, not only, you know, like a happy meal, but also have value like something that might be a little more nutritious, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just speaking about this, I'll just never forget when we first did Baby Boy John Singleton, Rest in Peace, people weren't really receptive. It was us, mm -hmm. our kind we weren't really receptive mm. because they didn't want to see those images mm. and that was a slap to my face because mm. I was that girl right I was Yvette right you know that was me I had a son that I had out of wedlock yeah. at a young age and so to shun her is to shun me mm. Mm. you know and I remember we had to fight to be proud of that project mm -hmm. because of ghetto it was this it was that but mm -hmm. again that's me mm -hmm. and if that's me imagine how many other girls need to see how many baby boys need to see this sure. like so I remember getting enraged and becoming indignant in my, in my interviews and yeah. I felt like I was fighting not only for myself but girls like me sure you know things have changed a lot lately because we tell a lot of a, a lot more diverse stories. stories right sure. but back then I don't know why the, the focus was on the hood at the time because it was boys in the hood right and ministers, you know and so I just you know finally I get my big break and people are shunning me and I'm like did you not see my work? I thought I was really good. Mm. <laughs> so mm. it was just interesting. It was an interesting time. Very mm. interesting time. But at the same time, it's out. a delicate balance, Absolutely. though. Absolutely. To tell those stories in a way that gives them light, mm -hmm. you know? And getting back to Color Purple, I mean, we're talking about a very tough period, mm -hmm. you know, in America, yeah. you know, for black folks. Mm -hmm. But th that is, there's such a transcendence in that, mm -hmm. in this, in in that film, you know, and Blitz, you know, handles it beautiful, and the, just, yeah. the, I mean, there's just a light that emanates out of it, you mm -hmm. know, and there's a transcendence of conditions, yeah, 
you know, and that's the thing that I think gives it beauty. And I, that's the thing that's very hard sometimes. And I think we miss because, he, you know, even listen to some, you know, we're talking about music now, you know, everything is about entrapment. I can't, I'd like, it's like, we've been going through shit forever. The old blues, you know, Robert, going back to Robert Johnson, W.C. they were, they, man. The stuff that they think, would think about. <laughs> but somehow, even in singing about those things, they rise above it somehow. Absolutely, yeah. And that's what scares me above. about what, 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 what's happening now. What's happening now. now. It's, it's, where's the joy? Where, where's the, the joy? Where is the, where, and maybe it is the, it is, it's a hopelessness. Yeah, it's hopelessness for like, sure. Well, God. I must say, this has been a pleasure, a real true pleasure um, for me. And like I said, I hadn't done one of these in so long. And all I needed to hear was your name. Literally, you can ask my publicist. She said, I want to ask a, her too. When I want you to. <laughs> but I'll show you the text. Because she was like, oh, I just got something really fun for you. Actors on Actors, you remember, you did it before. Jeffrey, well, I was like, fuck yeah, I'm there. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> and so we maybe, are definitely working together. Or if not, maybe we go down to the uh, wharf down in DC. Oh, we'll get some up, crabs you, um, you and some, um, some scrimp. Keep it simple. Yeah, we can totally go to scrimp do that. That's easy. <laughs> I want to go down the country and go crabbing and fishing. You can come. I want. I love to. Crab I got. A, I actually uh, bought a uh, a little boat, a little twenty five footer. That's go what out. we can do. We can go. We can roll out. Let's do it. And eat us some crabs. Come on. <laughs> we got you. This has been really great. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> this, this has, has been, been great. great.